If you ever thought Hockey Mask Jason was the inferior of the two masks, you're not alone. Today, I'm joined by Origin of Evil's Zuzana Kill on Slasher Sports Center. And I'm here to kill you. I am Dracula. Say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for? If not for shame. Six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face. The blackest eyes. The devil's eyes. I said, girls, did you know I'm utterly insane? Zuzat, welcome. Hi. <laughs> nice to be here. How, how did I do on the name? Ah, uh, you, you know, you tried really hard. <laughs> oh, that's the worst <laughs> thing to ever hear. <laughs> You know, the first name was perfect. Everything is fine. <laughs> I said but Kiel. It is, it's Kyle. Yes. Kyle. Yes. You told me. You told me this. Before Folk, we he even really got on. tried hard. He he practiced so much. <laughs> Cut him some slack. I, I practiced in the kitchen while I was making my coffee. <laughs> and I came back and I said, I'll never get it. Kiel. Kyle. Kyle. Oh, no. So, you gave in to your fears. Never do I that. I did. I did. Yeah. I gave it to my fears. And speaking of fears, that's what we're here to talk about. We're talk here to talk about the origin of evil. The da, da, da. Friday the 13th part two fan film, the sequel part two to part two, I guess you could say. It's not multiplication, so it's not part four. It's part two of origin of origin of evil, which started in the timeline of Friday the 13th part two. So this was Francesco Tesauro's I guess Woo. dive into I, I, his fandom. I, I share the same fandom. I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, pillowcase sackhead Jason over <laughs> the hockey mask Jason, even though he's completely human, not zombified yet. But he's he, to, to me, he's the scariest of the of the, the Jason incarnations. I guess. Yeah. Dude. The hockey mask gave him a sort of normal face than the than the pillow because under a pillowcase there can be anything. A hockey mask has eyes, so I get it as a face. Yeah, I get it. You know, the pillowcase only had one eye. Mm -hmm. it, it had the it one hole. To be honest, <laughs> scary but enough. You know, that, that mask was kind of a, I don't want to call it a rip off, but it was a rip off of the town oh. that dreaded sundown, and which is a great film in its own. It doesn't have nearly the recognition, obviously, because you haven't, you know, personified the main villain. You haven't given the backstory, or at least not on the depth of of Jason Voorhees. But um, yeah, you know, I, I was reading before um, before you came on, and I, I rarely read. I hate to read. I so very hate to read. But I was reading because, like, uh, you know, we're talking about horror icons and the star of the Warlock series, Julian Sands. Uh, I brought this up to you and I said I was going to get into it a little bit, but there's a crazy story going on with Julian Sands. He was hiking in the mountains in uh, San Gabriel, California. No, I'm sorry. The San Gabriel Mountains, which I believe are in southern to maybe central California. And he has gone completely missing. Oh, the actor, yeah. The British actor from uh, the Warlock series. And uh, he was also in uh, a season of 24. He was in a couple of romantic flicks that a lot of other people might know him from that I did not see. They were so sad. I could not see them. Um, I know our common friend uh, Shana Vins would would have seen this film because she's a chick flick kind of gal. But not us. Not us. But yeah, Julian I Sands. I got to admit, I don't know the, <laughs> them, sadly. So yeah, I'm just see, sitting so here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you've heard the heard of the films uh, Warlock and Warlock Two, Warlock Three, I think they stopped at three. He was mm -hmm. uh, the the titular character. He was the Warlock, the evil Warlock. So mm -hmm. that to me makes him a horror legend. And 
I mean, the poor guys trapped up in the mountains and probably in some very harsh weather. I know they had to call off the search party to, to find him. And I really hope he gets, you know, rescued up out of there. The guy's almost 70 years old and uh, probably, you know, probably I, I shouldn't guess, go out alone <laughs> into the no, woods. No, probably shouldn't. Actually, I don't think he was alone, but uh, he's, you know, the oh. um, he's, he's the recognizable one of the of the group, mm. I guess. And that's well, you know, that makes it more tragic somehow. Yeah, so I mean, hopefully they pull him out. But listen, speaking of warlocks, Souza, I, I need you to. I, I, th I think you're going to have to teach me how to play Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, sure, man, I'd love to. <laughs> no problem. I teach every one of you. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I know that you're a, a big fan of tabletop games, um, or I guess you know, role playing more specifically. Yeah, um, but you know, I, I've never played, and you know, you might be the only one. They can get me up to speed. What? <laughs> What's up? Yeah. But there's yeah, so many never. ways of playing. You don't even have to do the fantasy stuff if you're even more into sci-fi or even uh, thriller and, and criminal mind stuff. There is uh, a way to play for everyone out there. Well, give me the rundown. Like, give, tell, tell me what are the, uh, the, what are the basics that I need to know to oh. have a party here at home tonight? You know what you Dragons need? Party. This is this is the biggest thing. You need fantasy. Okay, this sounds a bit cheesy, but this is actually the most important thing you need because you write down everything you need to know to have the rules down. You have a piece of paper, the classical character sheet where all your informations are, what your character can do and stuff. But everything else is just fantasy and talking at the table I mean, there are folks who like to role play out their people, very flamboyant, but you can also just uh, be more down to earth and just say, my character does XY. Oh, I used the German pronunciation, but I guess you know what I mean. And uh, it's just an amazing way to do something that you may not be able to do in real life because I love to play some druids on Dungeons and Dragons, but sadly in real life, I can't cast up some flowers or animals and I don't know, bring earthquakes down or something, but it's a lot of fun if you are at a table with a lot of friends and talking about a cool story and well, the occasional, I don't know, conjured wolf or two. So, so how many players are there? You can play it uh, with as little or as many players as you want. The more players you have, the bigger the story gets and maybe a little bit more convoluted at the table. You know, if eight people try to talk over each other, it's a bit loud everywhere. But you can also play it with just two people. One, the dungeon master or the storyteller, if you like it uh, more that way, and a player. I actually have a game where it's just me and my boyfriend where he tells the story and everything that happens in the world. And I have a character that goes through it and interacts with this world. So you don't need a lot of people. You just maybe need a piece of paper and maybe some rule set so you can't do everything and it gets super crazy. Well, that's good because I don't have any friends. I've got one one very good friend. I, I, I could be the oh, dungeon no, master. Just... <laughs> have him you know going through all the all the motions i think that could be a a, a lot of fun uh so, so like who like in a group let's say we've got you know five or six people i mean who gets the ball first Wait. i don't i don't know it's like who's on offense who's on defense <laughs> this is this is like sports i assume ah uh, it's not fantasy football if you mean that <laughs> <laughs> no that, that it's uh... my alley. ah okay well um I always have to think about a, a funny advertisement that was made where a guy was invited to fantasy football. And because he's a D&D &D player, he thinks, wow, and then we do some fantasy stuff, you know, and he gets there with a lot of books and very nerdy. And then there are lots of jocks sitting at the table and uh, everybody's very confused <laughs> about the situation. <laughs> So you just well, okay. you just got to, uh, you know, you, you decide on some game rules you want to play. This is actually, if you go with the Dungeons and Dragons game, because it's well known, you decide on an edition you want to play, you know, a rule set. And everybody works within, with that rule set, which is actually just here to give you some guidelines so everybody knows what they're doing. And if you have that down, everybody creates a person, a character that they want to play. 
and then you roll dice. And the rule set will decide for you whether uh, it's uh, successful what you did. And you can you can do anything. You want to talk to a bartender about, I don't know, uh, giving you different prizes on your beer? You can roll about that. You want to punch him in the face because you don't want to pay that? You can roll that too, man. <laughs> That's what I'm into. Gen C says uh, she'll play D and D with us, and she's going to be a dwarf bard. A dwarf bard. That. That's a funny combination. Like Maybe that. you will you will throw some beer around and sing to that. I would love that. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Listen, this I'm not giving Jen any credit on this, okay? Because the opening scene of the Hobbit is exactly that. Are they not bards? They're they're all singing a song about uh, Bilbo Baggins hating something, whatever it is they're, they're singing about. See, Jen. You, well, you're maybe not, you're not invading his me. home and eating his food. I don't know. <laughs> Stuff yeah, to get giant, mad about. Giant cheese wheels. I'm, I'm with that though. I'm totally with that. And of course, here's horror maniacs Germany. Here we oh, are. Oh, hi, hi guys. <laughs> yeah, that we know. Uh, we know horror maniacs Germany to be. Christine Voltaire and Francesco Tesauro. Greetings to you both. Cheers. Cheers. I don't have but a beer know, to throw around now. I just have water, but here, cheers. <laughs> I've got coffee and it's terrible. But you know, hey, like when I get this group of friends together, who has to be mm -hmm. the uh, the referee or the dungeon master? Um, you know, who's uh, you know, who, who is it something that they're going to fight over? Does everybody want to be the dungeon master, or does nobody want to be the dungeon master? Sometimes you have the uh, little problem that, you know, the dungeon master has a different job than the players. You know, as mm -hmm. a player, you get to the table, you have your character, you know what the character can do, and you have an idea on what he is all about. If he is a sassy dwarven bard who wants to drink beer and sing songs about it, or if he is anything else. And the dungeon master is usually the one that came up with the idea of the story you're playing, because you're not just sitting down there and talking stuff like talking about beer or whatever, because we were in this analogy. But he comes up with the story that is happening around you and the uh, people that you meet and everything that reacts to you. The dungeon master is the world. So usually their job is to have some sort of story ready. They, they can be creative as what could happen if you have to fight an awesome warlock, you know, because we had a warlock earlier. Or if we have to find a dragon and help them or whatever. The dungeon master is the world and the characters that sit down, the players, are acting in this world. So if you go and you are a player, you have a group of five friends, you kind of need someone to be the creative mastermind that has a story ready. But fear not. There are a lot of pre-written stories and campaigns you can play so you don't have to come up with anything yourself. You can use books for that. I feel like I would there's money to be made in an ad lib D and D book. Like a, oh, a pre-written you story. <laughs> give, give me a verb, give me a noun, give me an adjective. Right? That's you know, I, I feel like there's there's money to be made. I'm gonna write one. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to write one. So, OK, how do you win? How, how when does the game end? Is it is it a time thing? Is it when everybody's ends. dead? OK, it can happen that everybody dies. Dies. This is a called a total party kill. So if you search for something like that, you will hear funny stories on how five people in a party got killed by, I don't know, someone opening a chest and suddenly gets eaten by the chest. Anything can happen. Uh, but usually, in the best case scenario, everybody survives and you kind of finish the story. It's up to your own if you have a long campaign where you go through from the first level as little idiots in a village being bored to being the epic, epic fighters that save the world. Or if you want to have just a little story where the, let's stay in this picture, the little idiots of the village kind of have to, I don't know, find someone that got lost and they find him, it could end there. It's always up to the uh, people and the group that are playing how much time you want to invest. For a lot of people, the great fun is to play it over years. The group that I'm playing in is, I think, going for five years now. So, but there, there are a lot of campaigns. I think I read about some guy who has a game that is going on for over 10 years now. So if this I is a nice hobby a game... that's... 
If I started a game today, I don't want to say a game. It almost feels like I'm minimizing the impact here. Is it? We don't call it a you game. Call it a call game. It, can we call it a game? Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm with that. Well, yeah, th there's a games masters, right? There's there's a games master for yes. for these. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, I, I want to be respectful of the uh, the the nerdery that is Dungeons and Dragons because I dig it. I, I need to know though, like. How do I choose my character? Like, I want to be a wood elf with, you know, Great. a bow and arrow who, All right. I don't know, has a, he's got a peanut allergy. And, um, <laughs> like, except when he uses his N95 mask, most importantly. Uh, and his only weaknesses are the wiles of bottom heavy female wood elves. Can I be that guy? <laughs> oh, great. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, you okay, have a character that's just, ready. <laughs> yeah, that's that's just me being myself. That's All right, just me being me for the for the most part. Okay, well, so I mean, if... that's good. I, I think I'm down with this. I, I th I'm going to make some phone calls, uh, not tonight, um, but I need to write a story that's going to get everybody in my house and out within 30 minutes. Because, <laughs> to be uh, honest, we, we... starting the game, even talking about your days, will take up to 30 minutes. Maybe do an hour. <laughs> It's more so fun. really, I should just invite friends over for coffee and, and donuts is really what I should be doing. Yeah, but also bring some character sheets and design some funny wood elves that are uh, hot for the big thighs. <laughs> Have you met my friends? Because they are their own characters, if I'm being <laughs> honest. I mean, I, I have a guy. He, he's actually about 6'1". Uh, he's my best friend. He's about six one, but like he's you know got the beard down to here, and he's a big guy. He might have an axe in the back of his truck. I don't know, but he's kind of a six foot dwarf. If if I really put it into <laughs> it's into, a big dwarf into context, yeah, he's a very big dwarf. But have you ever tried any of the uh, survival horror board games? I, I know I got. You some mean like my... a pandemic or something like that? I was thinking along the lines of like Camp Grizzly and Last Friday. I bought these games for my my kids uh, a few mm -hmm. Christmases ago, and um, How old they are, were, you, are your kids? Uh, well, you know my okay. my oldest <laughs> my my Wasn't oldest kid part. is uh, well, you know it's my oldest kid now is twenty. Ah, and yeah, okay. My, I thought they were no, little, and I I was no. a bit. Uh, is this topic good for them? But yeah, twenty. It's oh, it, it's, it's perfect fine. for them, and 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 it, and it would. I bought it when they were young, though. They were probably like ten years old, eleven years old when I bought Aww. it. Yeah, um, I, I I may have slingshotted them into horror a little bit too early in life. Um, I watched my first when I was like four, mm -hmm. and yeah, and it was Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, which is the uh, the irony. Oh, of all this. yeah, I, I I had to sneak and watch it. I've told this story too many times on this podcast, but. Basically, I had to wait for my parents to leave the house, and I snuck in their closet and you know got the movies out that I wasn't supposed to watch. There were maybe a uh -huh. couple of adult films in there I shouldn't have watched, and you know I didn't, to their knowledge. And um, <laughs> you know I found uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, and you know I, I can tell you why I knew I was a bad child, and it's because. So if you remember the way a VHS cassette tape is, you've got. You know, if you've never watched the I, film, I had them. I know them. <laughs> so on the left side, you see mm -hmm. all the tape, right? And then on the on the right side, you see none because you haven't watched it yet. But if you sneak into your parents' room and steal their movies, some of these films are half watched. So you have to be smart about it, Souza, and you have to you have to rewind the film back to yep. the part where it was before you put it in the VCR. And mm -hmm. so so that's what I did. And that is how I discovered the sneaky, the sneaky. Mark very sneaky. That's how I discovered the the Mark wheelchair kill in part two. And to this hmm. day, it's my favorite, maybe because it's the first I remember seeing. But if you remember this very recent, I say very recent, it's been a few years now. Um, Friday the Thirteenth uh, Xbox and, and PlayStation video game. The game, yeah. The Friday the Thirteenth, the game, the the new one, not the old NES one. But basically, what you have to do is sneak around and find parts to repair cars, telephones, boats, and, and the like, and escape from the map. Well, basically, mm. that's what these games are. Camp Grizzly is literally uh, you running around cabins. Maybe this is last Friday. I don't know. But you're running around um, you know, the, the spaces on the map, and they're cabin to cabin, and you have to find the parts to... Um, 
repair something in order to get you out of the you know mm -hmm. out of the, uh, the the map basically yeah yeah same premise very fun very good for probably four to six players something like yeah. that so I, I i would give it a shot it's it's interesting it's i i think i played a game that is, has a, a an idea that is close to that but it's actually more about uh zombies because uh my boyfriend has a board game that he loves to play and it is called uh oh don't i uh it's a mall of horrors where you are not in a big space uh and and like you have to find campgrounds but you are in a mall and the zombie apocalypse started so kind of you know post-apocalyptic as i would say and you have to go through the different rooms in a in the mall like a clothing store or the surveillance room and stuff and you have to fulfill some task and try to survive but the funny twist is you have you control a group of three persons with different uh, different um, uh, things that they can do but also the okay. problems that they bring and this is the funny part because one person of that is a girl and girls are squeamish so sure. she brings the most points at the end, but she's the hardest to have till the end because she screams and gets all the zombies to you. Well, I don't know so how bit... real to life that is, though, because the, the girl uh, always seems to survive, right? There's all there's there's no such thing as a final guy in a movie. There's there's a ton of final girls. You know, it's different medium. In a movie, of course, it's way cooler when the heroine comes up to the big hill and has a machete and a zombie head in her hand and then the camera flies over her and you see the devastation she left behind her. Of course, this is a wow, this is a beautiful picture. <laughs> but in a board game, it wasn't quite funny the first time you play it and you see like, oh, she gives so many points. Great. I'm going to have her till the end. And then you realize... Oh, she's also the hardest one to play. Yeah, okay, I get it. I, I like this premise, though, because, first of all, I'm very, very protective of my solitude, okay? When mm -hmm. when, when I don't have to be in a public setting, um, my private setting is very private. So it almost feels like if I do anything on the weekends, mm -hmm. the weekend's just been ruined because oh. now it's it's Monday and it's back to work, right? You know mm -hmm. back to real life so i think this would be a very fun thing to do and i think i'm going to do this um when uh, probably next week my best friend doesn't know it yet but we're going to be playing some board games because it is the royal rumble motherfuckers and we're going to be watching wwe um even though we're grown we are grown men <laughs> we're going to watch this but you brought up zombies right and um basically i finally finished watching the walking dead and oh man really yeah, <laughs> all of it finally all of it finally yeah and it took <laughs> me a very long time to get caught up um basically i had to catch up from like season nine mm -hmm. because I, I just pulled away from it um, yeah. I've, I've, I've done that a few times now uh you know when there were a couple of times when it slowed down for me Mm -hmm. And it's just so hard to watch week to week when it slows down. So I was just waiting for it to update on Netflix. And it updated like twice after, you know, before I even realized that it updated. So I ended up watching all the from nine to 11, uh, yeah. The Walking Dead. And I mean, did you ever get into the show? I got into it um, when the when it hit the uh, DVD shelves. So not from the beginning, um, but it actually lost me. I don't remember which season, but the season after Negan first came up. I don't know. What Negan season that is, is a yeah, but it's not the season where he appears, but the season after it, uh, because mm -hmm. the season where he appears was wild. It was fast and crazy. And this character was uh, he was everything. But the season after that, I think, slowed down, and then it kind of lost me, to be honest. I always wanted to read the comics, though, because I like the art style a lot, and I still have to annoy a buddy of mine that has all the comics to finally start them. 
Francesco, I'm assuming this is Francesco. He's probably being nosy on this podcast, and I don't blame him. He says it's hard to watch without Rick, I would say, and I would agree. No, 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 no. What? Rick goes? No, well, I mean, he, he, he left he left the show, but, you know, he doesn't, you know, he's okay. He's okay. I probably I will just tell him. myself that now. <laughs> Listen, it's like The Office, you know, when, when, when Michael left the show. And yeah, uh, it, okay. it's just impossible. It's impossible to watch it. You know, you, you, you take off the main yeah. character. It is so difficult. And that luckily, is fitting though, with the office. It's so fitting. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's literally Michael the left, same thing. It was weird. It, it was very weird. Even though, even though James Spader did an excellent job as a uh, Robert California, one of the greatest interviews I've ever seen. And I wish I wish that had been real life because I would love to interview the way that he interviewed at Dunder Mifflin. But let me really? let me just let me just back up, you know, for a second. When um, <laughs> Francesco says sorry for the spoiler, <laughs> <laughs> too late, <laughs> too late, Francesco. Damn it! Thank you. Well, so going back to the original like season of The Walking Dead, you said that you saw it when it hit hit you know DVD shelves or store shelves on DVD and. Like I was there and saw the premiere episode. I am pretty sure it happened on Halloween night. And Mm -hmm. I started watching with my parents. I would usually go and visit my parents on Sundays. So I would go and and, and watch it. So So your parents um, are horror fans too? No, absolutely not. But that doesn't change the fact that it was on the TV. Okay, it was on the TV and they had to watch it. (laughs) <laughs> pretty much pretty much oh so, oops, sorry it's now there <laughs> exactly so i have tried to introduce my parents to a lot more horror films that they could get into i'm not going to show them anything like saw or hostile or anything yeah. crazy like that but i am yeah. going to go back and maybe on thanksgiving i'm going to show blood rage because it's an 80s flick and mm-hmm. it takes place around thanksgiving yeah. On Christmas, I might show them Gremlins or something, you know, something that's lighthearted. Uh, My mom's 73, but she doesn't care about gory, bloody films, right? Um, Halloween was probably me pushing it, especially the the David Gordon Green ones, because yeah. they did get a little bit rough. Yeah, I, I get why. But right. actually, the interesting thing is my parents are not horror fans either, but I know that my mom introduced me to a lot of more thriller oriented stuff because she was like, I'm freaking scared of this, but I know you like this stuff. So here is the old movie. It or here, let's here is silent of the lambs. Go watch it. Yeah. Like I made it three quarters of the way through the movie and I think you can make it all the way. She, she, she was almost there, almost Ah. there, but just missed. But I'm sure she's giving you some good ones though, because um, there's if you put the the Venn diagram of thrillers and horrors in front of each other, you, you, you're going to have a lot of overlap. Yeah. And you, you'll, you'll see a lot of people arguing on like in Facebook groups about whether something is a, a thriller or a horror. And honestly, if it's horrific to you, it's a fucking horror. Just chill out on trying to gate keep the, the genres. It's yeah. OK. But I mean, I love, I love discussion. Oh, sorry. I mean, Mm-mm. I love discussing about genres. It's always a lot of fun to try to dissect something to understand it to a core. But it's not OK to start gatekeeping wars about whether the name is like this or the name is like this. And to be honest, thriller is a lot about psychological stuff. And this can be horrific, too. Psychological horror is a very valid genre, subgenre yes. rather. And that's kind of what happened with The Walking Dead, was it not? It mm-hmm. started off as a pure horror series and then eventually evolved into some sort of thriller situation. And, you know, it became with less splatter. about. Right, right. Exactly. With plenty of splatter. I mean, this is like, um, I don't know. Um, what what was the uh, not the ga- not Game of Thrones? What was the other one? The, the Showtime series. Um was it Spartacus? Ah, yeah. Well, yeah, Spartacus. Yeah, so Spartacus <laughs> oh, was just softcore porn with swords. Thank that, you. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. Right? I, I'm not wrong about that. But the, the premiere season of The Walking Dead was probably one of the most important things that I'd seen in a very long time because it got me back into the zombie flick. 
There, Ooh, you know, there, that's there nice. are a lot of hit and miss. There are a lot of hit and miss. I, I didn't get into, or I did for a little while, the, the Resident Evil series, you know, films with Mila the George. Films? The films. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I started off and then it just kind of got a little cheesy for me, became more of an action film. I, I expected yeah. it to be more like horror, but like the games did that as well. It started off as a very straight up horror game and yeah. then slowly evolved into an action game. And, that, and that's fine because you got to have action yeah. in the films. But because of that, actually. That too. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Resident Evil is a funny topic because the first movie I watched back in the day, I thought, you know, being younger, this is cool. And she is such a cool hero and she can do anything. And then he was when I when I met my my boyfriend. Now, I we came to the topic of horror movies and such. And then I talked about Resident Evil was cool. And he was like, did you play the game? No. Mm. I am a big rabbit. I'm a bunny when it comes to that, because I, I watch everything, but I can't play horror games. So he had to play the game for me. and hot damn <laughs> the game was so scary at moments i sat behind my blanket and i was like please let this part end so Resident why why, Evil has why can't a... you play because it's my responsibility for the character to survive and i'm a big oh. chicken and i go like this <laughs> and then the character dies so if i can watch it i know nothing can happen to me bring it but if i have to survive on my own ah! Well, then you're going to have to figure out a way to play Resident Evil 7, but in VR, the the, the, the virtual reality. You have to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is a completely different monster altogether, and wow. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, so I mean... I Especially it, VR, it, it, it seems so terrifying because then it's around you. It's, <laughs> it's all around you, and it's behind you, and if you wear the earbuds, you can hear it behind you. It's like there were times where I would I would purposely stop in a hallway and like lean forward to try to see if I can see around the door. Because if I don't mm -hmm. move my feet, if I don't move my feet, I'm yeah. not technically past the part of the game that would trigger the, ah, uh, the you want to, to wall, wall yourself out there. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I'm, Just, I'm no you know, better gonna than you. Squeeze through. <laughs> yeah, I'm no better than you. <laughs> no better than you, but like film makes it completely different. And to go back for a second to The Walking Dead, that first season, yeah. they they did a um, after the first season was over and they were teasing the second season on a uh, AMC. They mm -hmm. did um, a black and white running of The Walking Dead, and I can't find that anywhere. Um, and it was Ooh. very appropriate. You couldn't watch the later seasons in black and white, but if you go back and watch season one in black mm -hmm. and white, it does very much have a feel of the original uh, yeah. Night of the Living Dead. And I think that's what they were going for. But I think I want to watch that because that sounds amazing. It, because it has some I never saw it on the other seasons. Too. Yes, huh. it never felt like they did that on the seasons after that. Because the seasons yeah. were longer. I think they were like 20 episodes or more yeah. after you know season two and later on. But in season one, it was only like five or six episodes. And those black and white ones, you could like, you know, throw some popcorn in and make a night of it because it was fantastic. And I and that's what I expected the series to be going forward. But of course, things have to evolve. But for what felt like years, it was must mm -hmm. watch TV because you just never knew who was going to die. Right. You know, characters just seemed too important to die. Very few of them seem too important to die. Maybe just like a handful. But everyone else for weeks, you'd start to like them. Uh, they're doing good deeds. You know, they're standing up for what's right for the group. And then follow the following week. In a desolate this, world, they are heroes. In, exactly. They are heroes. <laughs> but then the following week, they step off in a hole. They fall down with a walker falling on top of them. They get bitten. Of course, Rick, as the leader, he's got to put him down. And yeah, you know, so, so random, so unexpected. But that was the, but calling the card more the hurtful because you got to love the character. And this Absolutely. is why I'm at some point always suspicious of everything the movies or the TV tries to throw at me because at some point it's gotten so you gotten so used to it to I really like this character. This is a nice empath you can empathize with that character. Maybe he's like the rough diamond uh, that needs a bit more more polish and but he's a uh, he's trying to be good. 
at some point it always feels like, are you building up to something movie? I'm afraid <laughs> because usually they, they this person goes. <laughs> Yeah, you don't. You're, you're afraid to like somebody too much, and you can't do that with The Walking Dead. You can't do that with uh, Game of Thrones. And you know, people yeah. just started to kind of you know follow that pattern, I guess. But mm -hmm. I, the, the the one guy I'm thinking of, it, it happened in the earlier seasons. You would have seen this season. Um, do you remember the guy who ha who who owned the RV, the 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 camper? Um, I uh, yeah. He was the yeah, guy I that taught Glenn. Yeah, I don't remember his name. Uh, it's yeah. like Paul, maybe? Is it Paul? Phil? Ah, uh, my comic book is downstairs. I can't go around and look at it. <laughs> it's yeah, all but right. the, well, the that's guy the first on the RV, he was a little bit of the dad of the group and he tried yes. to, to be the nice one. Yeah, he was he was amazing. He's the guy that taught Glenn how to be a mechanic, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. And later on, you know, years later into the show, somebody asked um, like Glenn, how do you know how to fix this? And Glenn's like I had a pretty good teacher. And it's like, oh, oh. gosh, they're talking about my Paul. heart. <laughs> I think his name's Paul. Yeah. So, I mean, it was must watch TV for me. W was it ever that mm -hmm. way for you? I know you only made it to six or seven seasons, but like, was it ever like, man, I can't miss this? Yeah. Uh, because back then, when the DVDs came out, it became a habit of gift. Uh, I, I always got them gifted to me on like birthdays or, uh, or Christmas. But the problem was at some point, I always watched the season in like one sitting if I was able, you know, uh, sure. physically. But um, I tried to watch it as fast as I could because the, the way this TV show was written, the cliffhangers and everything, it was so addictive. You wanted to get more of it. You wanted to know what happens next because this was so good. And at some point it got to the point where I had to buy them myself because I didn't want to wait. And it was a bit of a crash because it's like, hey, I wanted to give this to you for Christmas. I already have it because I had to watch it. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's seasons one, two, that. three were. Well, it, it, it takes no time to get through those. Because you just can't stop. You you tell yourself at you know two a.m. Uh, you know I can I can watch one more. I really only mm -hmm. need like five hours of sleep. That's all I really need. And then you end up watching two more because the cliffhangers are so good. And you end up saying, you know what? Doctors sleep all the time with only two hours of sleep. <laughs> it's, it's it's nothing new to the humans, right? And then but by, you know what? You know, I know what helps too. The opening music is great but also perfectly stressful to always get you awake again because <gasps> the, a, the, the music is so good. Yes. It's it stresses coffee. you out so you wake up again. That's <laughs> it's just like coffee. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a terrible way to, to make a film and make a TV series because you know that you are enabling people from going to work the next day. I was that way with a TV show called 24. Do you remember 24? Kiefer I am afraid was... that I will confuse it with a movie 24. <laughs> so I'm Maybe. not sure. Tell me about it. So Kiefer Sutherland was in this one. It was kind of a, it was kind of like a, a an anti-terrorist type organization here in the United States. Um, yeah. Almost like almost yeah. like the FBI, right? Well, yeah. so like it was that series. I, I would do that. I would stay up. I, I have to be up at like 6 a.m. and then I'm telling myself, man, it's midnight. I only really need five hours of sleep. I'm going to watch one more. And then the cliffhanger kills me and I have to watch another one. And that turns into another one. And there were just some days where I just went in like the next day and it's like 2 a.m. And I'm like, oh, man, I only got like three hours of sleep and uh -huh. it's OK. I'll sleep when I get home. Do I sleep when I get home? No, I don't. I put on 24 again to get caught up. And then I'm telling yeah. myself th th that very same night, I really only need four hours of sleep. This Doctors is always the, the I'm still young. I can survive this. Other people go to parties. I watch shows. Come on. I, I, I'll do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could be doing a lot Awful. worse. <laughs> could be doing a lot worse. But, you yes. know, like these shows always end up jumping the shark. And uh, hang on. Okay. I, I don't. Jumping I don't the shark? I, okay. I, I knew it. I knew there was going to be an issue when I said that. So I forget that some American sayings probably don't make it very far from the States. So you I don't know, know what I mean. Jumping the shark, but it okay. means like you are going to do something critical. Sort of in the context okay. of TV shows, 
So mm-hmm. back in the, and somebody's going to correct me on this, but I think it was like the seventies, maybe early eighties. There was a TV show called happy days. Okay. And happy uh-huh. days was a show that like, if you know anybody in their sixties, they probably love the show. Uh, it actually starred uh, Ron Howard. He, the, the, the director, Ron Howard. So happy days had a, a really cool character named Fonzie, uh, Arthur Fonzarelli. Okay. He was like the edgy, cool guy on TV at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, the the show had run for so long and they came up on an episode where he was going to jump over a shark either like on skis or on his motorcycle. I can't remember exactly. Come on in a cool way. Right. It it was just going to be something. He was going to jump over a shark. Well, after that point in the show, the show was never the same. It was just never quality like it was when it first started. But we Ah. know that like at all times, dancing shoes will, will always lose their shine. It does not matter. They will always get a little murky. And that's what happened with Happy Days. They just happened to be able to pinpoint the episode where it was good before this and it wasn't good after this. Mm-hmm. And I feel like maybe, okay, in the context of The Walking Dead, the Negan episode, I feel like that's probably where they jumped the shark because you have this huge buildup and then Negan comes out of the trailer and he says, I bet you're shitting yourself right now. And then he does the eeny, meeny, miny, mo, And then he picks the guy, that, the, the, the guy or girl that he's going to yeah. kill. And then it goes yeah. off and we don't get it. Right you know, <laughs> it, it was an amazing episode. It was an amazing yeah. buildup because anybody who, who did know anything about the comics knew that the character Negan was coming up. And he, we knew that he was like a, a major badass, like the, the villain of all villains. And then a villain we in co- a desolate time where everything is a zombie and survival. And then there comes Negan, who even is, is even able to put a cherry on top of that. Yes. If it yeah. gets worse than zombies that will eat your face, it mm-hmm. is Negan who carries mm-hmm. around the baseball bat with the barbed wire and he's got his leather <laughs> <So>. jacket. <laughs> So, who, who's saying this if there's a person in this world who can jump over a shark well this person is fine you're damn right it is francesco <laughs> you're damn right it is and you know, you're gonna have to look that up by the way Susa. you're gonna have to look up jumping the shark the, the jumping the shark I will episode do my homework. well jumping the shark in the context of the walking dead to me was a negan episode and you said that you'd never did you say that you had read the the graphic novels or you wanted to only like the the first few issues i, okay. I my uh, a friend of mine has all of them so i should just get uh, like my butt out of the chair and start reading them because they're really good apparently so you have them it's, it's there for you to do it is yeah. there for you to do it's there for my reading well that once you get to a certain part there is a character who takes an arrow through the eye, okay? And it is a character who in the show, um, fuck it, you've already seen it, so I don't know why I'm even dancing around it. (laughs) I was just waiting for you to try to walk around the Yeah, I I, I don't know why I did that, but it was Abraham. Abraham took the the arrow through the eye, okay? And we know what his fate in the show was. But Mm -hmm. if you knew about the comics or the graphic novels and you know that in the show, he's not the one who takes the arrow through the eye. It's the female Mm -hmm. doctor who they spent very little time building up. Yeah. But but, you know, she became a character, an important character to the group in a very small amount of time. But you see that she took the arrow and Abraham didn't take the arrow. So they must be saving him for something. So on this build up to something Negan, bigger. yeah. So you, on this build up to Negan, who did Negan pick to to kill? Mm-hmm. You have to wait that whole uh, fall season, the whole autumn season, to see who it was. You know, you're doing your your best, you know, Hercule Poirot, mm-hmm. and you are doing the investigation, and ah. It must be Abraham that he's going to kill because Abraham was supposed to take the arrow through the eye and they saved him for Negan. So Glenn is safe. No. Glenn is safe. (laughs) No. (laughs) Right? So that, to me, that was the the excellent swerve. It was an excellent swerve. And I think it was done geniusly. But geniusly to their own detriment. 
because once Negan beat the shit out of Abraham and Glenn, it was only downhill from there. And That's interesting because the scene was incredibly well done. I was on the edge of my seat and I, I still love to think about also the, the technical stuff about the way they moved the camera to have them being this imposing monstrous lunatic that is in total control about life and death here nobody can do nothing and this crazy psychopath can do what he wants and because he is who he is he will do something horrible the whole way the show portrays this also in the music in the cutting it's a beautiful scene but it's exactly that after that moment it was so hurtful and their loss was so big i mean you had sympathies for everyone and Everything that happened after that with the characters taking the revenge, taking their own path, everything, you felt empathetic because, of course, but somehow a little piece of the excitement of the show was left with Glenn on the floor, beaten down. Because it could I never don't know be why. matched. Because yes, it could never be matched. The peak was so high. How do you top that without be going into the every show has to overtop itself at some point and become stupid? Like right. The so af <laughs> after the mystique of Negan wore off, um, they had to do something different to mm -hmm. keep it fresh. You you can't just keep having the villains become bigger and badder um, because I, eventually, again, the dancing shoes will lose their shine. Yeah, um, I mean, they so kind of th did that because you every few seasons you have a new group of people that become the antagonist. You have a new group of <sighs> something that has to be conquered overthrown eliminated something in the way and it was always a weird group of people you remember the governor the with uh when they had their in the beginning yes. i don't remember i think the name was governor right when he came up with the tank exactly to it. the prison yes <laughs> freaking tank man but and, and that fucker cut off this kind uh, of you... Eugene? No, not Eugene. What was the the, the the old farmer? Herschel. That fucker cut off Herschel's head. Like it doesn't get worse than that. Right? Ah, yes. It, it gets no and worse. Herschel than was that. also such a dad figure. Yes. And yeah. he, he was probably the 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 most beloved universally, you know, figure in the show. So they go from this <laughs> primitive, primitive type of lifestyle, you know, in, in the earlier seasons, pre-Negan to a, a, a more advanced type of militant approach where everyone just knew how to fight. They're running infantry drills. And, you know, by the end, none of the ones who were supposed to, you know, who were supposed to fear felt very bad anymore. Even the whisperers mm. and alpha or beta and none of those guys felt, you know, fearsome, you know, after Negan, the governor, and I guess even Shane to a point, you know, the, the my heart goes out the... for Shane because I really like that character. He had such a great struggle, and of course, he was put in a bad position and everything. And then the way he went was like, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, it was. Yeah. And it, it, there was a time though where maybe even people questioned whether Rick would remain on the show because people were kind of behind Shane. Mm -hmm. They, they thought uh, like it, you know it was what? more gonna... team Shane than team team Rick. Oh, damn. yeah, it, it it's almost <laughs> like uh, we were almost like the, the 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 little teenage girls who watch um, Twilight. Are you are you team Jacob or <laughs> or team yeah. uh, Larry? Who's the other guy? Who Jacob and who is Jacob a name? From Twilight? Uh, I, know I, you I know. don't, don't want to, to to reveal that I know stuff about it, but it was team Edward or team Jacob. <laughs> Old Ed, so I, I don't I don't know if I would have been Team Ed or Team Jake, but um, it's but yeah. sparkly uh, old guy versus uh, pathetic teenage werewolf. Pick pick well, your I poison. Could, I, I, I guess I would have to go with a werewolf. I like werewolves more. Wait a minute, you said old guy. How old is Bob Pattinson? He's a vampire, so he's supposed to be oh, like over a hundred years old. Okay, so he's like 12 yeah, in, the, in, the, in the show. Oh, in the movie. Okay, gotcha. He's yeah, of, I, let's say he's of legal age to make the audience. Yeah. Well, back then, who's the question of legality, right? Who, who, <laughs> who even knows? They were doing fucked up <laughs> shit back then anyway. But gosh, I mean, listen, the, the, the yuppies at the end of The Walking Dead made this thing kind of a lackluster finish for me. I hope you can oh, go back okay. and watch it, though. I hope you can go back and watch it. 
Just, yeah, just but uh, to be honest, I would have started to to start. I I think I would start at eight, one season before Negan to have that great build up again, and then I would really try to go over that peak and just uh, get the story down. So Flovey says, "Is he a vampire? I always thought he was a fairy, He's sparkly living in the woods." <laughs> you got a damn good point there, Flovey. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's probably the most compelling case for him being a fairy. So fairies versus werewolves, who wins? Werewolves. Okay, well, always the werewolves. Well, you know, means yeah. to an end. It's all right. Well, I mean, we can we can go with with fairy though. That that sounds pretty good. But you know, oh, I know that Flo, Flo will be uh, going on a length about how fairies or fays are way more advanced than everything. But I still stick to the to the wolfy boys. I'm with you. You're you're a big fan <laughs> of the werewolf film anyway. Yeah, I am a huge fan of those. Uh, I really like the idea of werewolves. It's a creative thing, in my opinion. And movies have such a great challenge to make them look good, which also resulted in a lot of movies with werewolves that did not look good. But... Uh, they uh because the the challenge is so so interesting uh, a lot of uh, movies also went into the practical effects and i love those those are great these are always look better looking than just cgi and green screen the the transition the werewolf transition has become i guess a, a point of emphasis in werewolf mm -hmm. films lately and i guess you have to go back to an american werewolf in london Thank you american werewolf in london this is the best werewolf movie period <laughs> in my opinion at least i love this movie so much. well it definitely sets the standard if you ask me now you, if you mm -hmm. ask my dad like how do you make a movie immediately better mm -hmm. you add a werewolf to anything <laughs> yes Na <laughs> name name the worst chick flick you can think of just name one off the top of your head chick flick Yes. Uh, I kind of want to go with uh, what was the name? The Rise of the Killing Tomatoes. Okay, add Is a werewolf, and it's still... better. <gasps> I mean, even the tomatoes come to life and kill stuff. Imagine if they got some wolfy legs and start running. See, see, it it's it's a flawless <laughs> concept. You add a werewolf, your film becomes better, no matter what. <laughs> so if you, you named the transition scene. And if you are not able to nail this, be brave enough to leave it in the black. Like, don't show it then. Because if you show a bad transition scene, it ruins a lot, in my opinion. Like, well, I love the movie, the Underworld movies. Yeah, they're yes. a little bit trashy, but I mean, come on. Guilty pleasures, everyone. But the transitioning, the werewolves alone, they look cool. And if they're not werewolves, still cool character designs. But the transitioning, in my opinion, it looks a little bit like some Legos being stuck together under some fur. Okay. Eh. Nah. It's okay. weird. Well, Kate Beckinsale can do no wrong. Okay. So as, as, yeah. as bad as the films were, she's in it, and that makes it an A-plus film to me. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, you might want to just remove the werewolves. <laughs> oh, like, no. It, no? You still need the yeah. You still need the big hunks of of fur and teeth that smack them around. Because if, if it's replaced... just <sighs> then it's a oh, bit yeah. boring. Well, what if we replace the werewolves with sparkly fairies? Then okay, it's never not mind. dark anymore. Never mind. Then it's never not mind. underworld anymore. <laughs> For, forget I brought it up. Forget I even brought it up. No, no to werewolf... sparkly fairies. Hemlock Grove was a series that I thought was pretty strong, and it had one of the better transitions. Is that what it was called? I only Hemlock actually Grove? haven't watched that one. I only know the transition scene, and I liked it. It was yeah, good, it, but it was, it was not the best in a keeping long time. me on the edge on my seat. Yeah. Really? Well, you're the werewolf expert. I'm, to I'm be just... honest, I'm a I'm super picky. <laughs> well, and maybe you know... I idolize American Werewolf in London a bit too much, so... I'm having a hard time seeing anything else as okay. Uh, rather, not so well-known movie Skinwalkers uh, yeah. was uh, had an interesting transition scene that was also nice, but not groundbreaking. But at least they tried to make it also completely practical. 
and also show the nice in-between state, you know, when they're still humanoid, but they're starting to go into the wolfy thing when they have their weird eyes and the nose becomes too much for, for a human face and such. And it looked wonky, but actually because it was a practical thing, it felt good. It didn't feel out of place. So I think it's really hard to nail this. It is. And, you know, I, I talked to a good friend of mine. I hate to keep bringing his name up because he's going to get a big head about this. But a good friend oh. of mine, Ben Johnson, brought up, he says, you know, if if somebody's making a, a movie and they're putting their complete heart in it and it turns out to be bad, that's beautiful because they're putting their heart into it. And that's what makes it a yes. great bad film. But if you yes. make a film purposely trying to be bad, to be oh. edgy or whatever, then it's just garbage. Stop doing that. Try your, you know, try with everything that you have to make this film good. And if it comes out bad, you know, we're going to forgive you for it and we're going to love it. I love, love it. especially these trashy horror movies. I I love, uh, 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 what was it, Brain Dead from uh, the Lord of the Ring guy back in the day. That thing is so trashy but because they tried everything with it they they mixed up their own uh zero blood mixture to make it still uh look decent and have their own crazy story and everything i love it when people go out and make stupid movies because they put passion to it or you know the 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 new zealand movie uh black sheep i think where the black sheep, sheep was great turn into were sheeps what <laughs> That thing is crazy and it looks so low budget and everything. But you know what? Between, behind especially these trashy horror movies, you know there is a crew that lives and breathes that. It's Facts. just heartwarming and it's beautiful. And more, more of these people, I want more groups to get together and say, you know what? We make this. It's stupid. We don't have money. We try everything we can and it will be fun. Please, everybody, do more of it. I love those. <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because um, the, the same guy, Ben Johnson, you're talking about the, the sheep turning into were sheep. Um, the name of his film that's coming up is uh, The Curse of the Were Deer. So you're going to get your witch. Amazing. Amazing. Curse <laughs> of the Were Deer. And it's, and it's got some, some good friends uh, that I've come to know over the last year. Um, so happy to know them. And they've been guests on this show. But Curse Ooh. of the Deer is absurd and it's from the heart and it has a cast of people who I would absolutely put over the moon if I could. Aww, and that's so yeah, cool. Speaking of fun, though, OK, it seemed like you had a lot of fun in Origin of Evil 2. This film directed yes. by my good friends Francesco Tesauro and Christy Ooh. Voltaire. Yay! So who... Who approached you about joining the cast of Origin of Evil 2? Actually, it's a bit around the corner because my boyfriend, uh, Phil, was uh, he knew Francesco and uh, the movie before ours, he got to play a little role. He was uh, the camper that went out with his girlfriend and got uh, stabbed while peeing. Yes, you do. He was he was the first death. Yes, I, the first death. I in the think film. it was the first death. What was he I first, so. or was Christine first? I think it was him because he went out to take a whiz, and then when uh, Christine was at the camp and doing campy stuff, uh, she thought Phil would be coming back, but in real, it was Jason. I think I hope that, I don't talk any nonsense here. Yeah, no. It's, if if anything, I, I've got the nonsense in my head the same way you do. Okay, here we go. Christine was, was first. first. Okay, we we, we, we heard it from the from the source. From the source. <laughs> we apologize, Christine. We don't want to be out here spreading false rumors. False about, information. Yeah, it, it's it's important to be first, right? Because if as Ricky Bobby said it, you're not first, you're last. So there you go. So your boyfriend was the second one to My die. My boyfriend in... was the second death, yes. And then it was like, uh, hey, Francesco is still searching for someone who wants to join. Would you be up to it? And then I said, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do a horror flick. So how did that conversation go? Like, What type of sweet talk did they have to use to, to get you to do everything that you did in this film? 
I was easy to convince. <laughs> it was like, hey, I want to do this. Would you like to do it? And I was like, I'm already on my way. <laughs> yes, let's do it. I uh, I enjoy a lot of, of trying out new things, especially when it comes to, to stuff like that. So I just was happy to be part of it. And even if I would just be there to splash around some fake blood, I would have done it. <laughs> Well, the final girl of part one, Shana Vines, was mm -hmm. on the show a couple of months ago. And she not being a horror fan, she did require a little bit of sweet talk. Um, so it, it, it took no convincing for you to agree. You would have agreed to anything, a, a beheading or anything. Kind of, yeah. I'm with it. Uh, I'm, I'm with it. I mean, I uh, had a bit of uh, uh, theatrical stuff at uh, back in the day in school, and because I was especially a fan of when it comes to practical effects, like trying to bring that blood splattered somewhere there or get that thing to move without anyone seeing. We had a few projects in school where we had to do some advertisement stuff, and a f few friends of mine, we actually tried to redo Paranormal Activity. And we used her a little bit, of, just a very narrow kitchen. And we had uh, uh, fishing rods, you know, because you wouldn't see them if you have a bit of a blurry picture. Sure. We had this whole room full. It was like a spider web of, uh, of fishing uh, rods. And one was filming and we had like four people behind it standing somehow to get the strings to move and move <laughs> all the cabinets and stuff. And in the end, it looked super weird but just trying to bring something like that to life with no gadget whatsoever this is stuff that i enjoy so so much and then being able to be part of someone who has actually a little bit of equipment to do it properly yeah that was cool i wanted to be part of that well i think you joined the right team and they cast the right person uh director francesco tesauro he he also plays jason in the origin of evil short films mm -hmm. Uh, Italian guy living in Germany. Yeah, living in Deutschland. He's a uh, he's a fun guy. Um, he's a passionate guy. He's a passionate guy. Tell me about your relationship with Francesco and Christine. Uh, oh, it was a lot of fun, and it was so 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 nice because you come to them and you start to talk about the stuff, and it was you 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 immediately see they they live they love for horror collectors mask and and mask and and little replica weapons from horror movies everywhere nice replicas even also from from star wars cool laser uh laser swords oh, oh no i'm missing man. my english here now we're, yeah uh, we're, we're gonna have to end this right now <laughs> you're, you're, you're about to get me canceled oh no Susa, Susa, i'm gonna get canceled uh, lightsabers uh, let the, uh, oh, yeah let, let the fair, star wars people know that she Dear Star Wars sabers. people, I apologize very sincerely. It's just because yeah. it's been a while yeah. that I talk English so much. So please don't uh, come at me. The, they're, me they're, <laughs> see, I knew there would be one. Flo B, Light we, we, yeah, we, I know, Flo. I'm we, sorry. We, 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 we prostrate, or prostrate ourselves before you and beg your forgiveness. Yeah, I already so. know that a few friends of mine will call me after that and ask me what the hell is wrong with me listen if any star wars fans are listening right now it's because you brought them here because they were not here before you got here what but yeah i don't I don't think any star wars fans can love sci-fi and horror i could be wrong on that I, maybe somebody will correct me but i don't i don't know that i've ever been approached with um oh hey look here Luke said laser sword in a movie, so it's fine. See, hey, okay. I'm just a deep dive fan, so I use I just used the lesser known pronunciation. Yes, well, saved. All's well that ends well. Yeah, we we got out of that one unscathed. So let's talk about your character. How much of you in real life did you put into your character in Origin of Evil Two? Hmm. I think. Real me would have moved a bit faster away from all of this. But it's correctly that I would sit in a car and just listen to music while I wait for my biggest sister to uh, put the road stop away because I can be lazy sometimes. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And you're wearing a, <laughs> a, a, you're, 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 you're wearing a similar uh, flannel as to what you were wearing in the show. So I mean, it, I'm it actually wearing the same one, I think. <laughs> 
Oh, Have you changed honest. clothes since you made the movie? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, let's I put it, put it on the honestly, record. Honestly, I have like three of these red flannels. Uh, I I have a very um, yeah, my wardrobe is quite consistent. <laughs> yeah, my son has like five of the same kind, and it's, it's like Pee Wee Herman. You know, it's like Pee Wee Herman opening up the closet. He's got all those and just those, the same the, thing. Yeah. Was it Pee Wee yeah. Herman? Or was it Mr. Bean? It might have uh, been. Mr. Bean been has both. this also. I'm sure. Okay, I'm sure it's a running gag. In 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 the the next one, uh, maybe you can get a scene where your closet is just nothing but flannels. I, I would be, I'd be okay with that. That would be good. Yeah. So this is your first acting role. I'm I'm, I'm yep. sure the I'm sure the advice of just be yourself was welcome. So, but I have to know like what kind of direction did you get from Francesco? I mean, because I know the guy's nuts. Um, in, in the <laughs> you first have to film, be nuts to to do stuff like this. Come on. <laughs> it's in, like in a the job first film. <laughs> Well, I know he wanted Shana Veans to stand near a tree and let him throw an axe really close to her. Um, she wasn't having it. So did you run into anything like that? Actually, no, because um, Thank goodness. I think he, let's say, learned a little bit from that. Or <laughs> let's say uh, uh, Christine learned a bit. Uh, learned a little bit from that because she told us about it like a funny anecdote, but it felt a little bit like, yeah that <laughs> but it was well, really you know, funny because they showed these scenes to us and um we had one scene where helena had to do the the spear thing you know yeah and she stabs jason and at some point we were thinking about throwing it and then we, it was like ah! yeah nah. that's a hard one to pull off you know throwing a spear uh especially if you want to be you know, in this physical fight with with Jason, you know, during the uh, one of the final scenes, I'm not going to spoil I mean, it because we Jason, are going to have. Of course, he's. Of course, of course, and it's Francesco. You're not going to out wrestle Francesco. He he he'll, I don't he's, think a so, <laughs> he's a fighter. He's he's a fighter. I so, I actually tried and I did not succeed. But you live to tell the tale, and that's important. So um, my character you, you know, didn't. We, we don't know that. We, no. we don't know that. Well, we know that. for now. She could still be under the water. She could still be. I guess she's still there. But, you know, just last night, I swear to God, just last night, I found the gag reel or the uh, like the blooper reel. Uh, it was short, <laughs> but it was fun. And was you know, I'm going to yeah. I'm going to put the link. I'm going to put the link to the blooper reel and to Origin of Evil Part 2 in the description of this episode. So did you did you already know your co-star uh, Helena Dumeyer? Oh man! I'm no, we actually met on on the day when we started to plan out everything, when to shoot, when what to shoot, and, and when we were brainstorming a little bit about the roles and uh, and uh, uh, and about the dialogue. But did she? Nobody was found. Maybe our character still. Yeah, that's what he said. We don't know it. Maybe I'm still lurking somewhere. Got to watch the next title a... to <laughs> to to figure it out. You no, carefully chose the other. word lurking. Uh, very smart. You are. So, yeah, so, we met, so you met each other there. on set. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it was super, super nice. But I think if you agree to play in a fan movie that has a little crew and just wants to do things out of passion for the topic, I think you always meet some similar minded people. Because, I mean, you, as I've said before, you got to be nuts and to to do things like that so it was very fun and we we hit it off uh, on the first day just uh, talking because actually we figured out that we both work at cinemas so there was a connection there already <laughs> well i i really like helena she, I, I wanted to have her on the podcast as well uh she's a little shy which is wild uh, because you know she had a scene where probably probably my favorite if i were to take a single still shot like a single picture from either of the origin of evil films. Oh, I'm my, excited to hear what it is. My, perf my favorite still shot would be the scene of Helena with her big glasses on having, I think she's, this is where she stabs Jason with the, the spear and there's the blood spatter on her face. Yes. I love that. It was yelling. Shot. That shot is so cool. I love that shot. And it was so, so, nerve-wracking to shoot it because 
we know if we get it wrong, it would be a little bit hard to do it again because of the fake blood being uh, being on the glasses and the clothing. So uh, we she decided to turn around her uh, her uh, long sleeve to if mm -hmm. we somehow manage to fuck it up, then she could still turn around her shirt and it would be fine. But because of the glasses and having the glasses to be perfectly clean after that, it was a little bit nerve wracking to shoot that scene. But it looked so good when the it big blood go went there and her face really being in an in fighting mode. It yeah, that was cool. She did a great job on that as well. Yeah. And so, I mean, my question to you: now that you've gotten your feet wet in in a horror short, like what's next? I mean, even if you don't have anything lined up just yet, what would you like to do? Oh, to be honest, I really enjoyed playing uh, uh, a typical horror victim <laughs> uh, uh, because it's a lot of fun to do these intense scene of like being captured, having to fight someone off because you get to do so much. And also because it's a little bit uh, of a challenge to bring it to life, not just like standing around. Ah, but being really in a moment and having these big emotions. And I th I th think this, especially this kind of challenge is really cool. If I would get to play a crazy stalker though, I think I wouldn't mind also. But in general, I think the next uh, slasher victim, I, I, I can die on your movie, hello. <laughs> so you, vo you you tribute yourself to the next stab wound. I'm I'm good with it. I mean, I, I like that. I, I hope, you know, you you do everything you ever put your mind to, Susanna Kail. Uh, before we get out of here, though, uh, we really should tell everybody about the next installment of Origin of Evil. Uh, Francesco gave me the rundown in his own words. So, oh, oh yeah, right. in his own words. In general, we have a young Jason Voorhees in 1957 who escapes from Camp Crystal Lake and lives in the woods, as one does. And a young girl will find him before he disappears. And 24 years later, she will meet Jason accidentally. And, you know, Sousa, I highly doubt things are going to be the same between them. No, so, no, no. Oh, no, no, not at all. Do you think you'll be working with Francesco and Christine again, or are they just two bananas? I mean, I would I'd like to see in... a reunion. No, no, no. I, I Of course, uh, I'd like to work again. I mean... A passionate team and uh, stalking in, uh, in in the middle of the night around in the woods. Yeah, bring it. I couldn't have said it better myself. So if you've had a good time listening to this episode, go ahead, stab that like button. Uh, or if you're listening to the podcast realm, give us a rating, share with your friends. Uh, this show grows by word of mouth because I am not a shield. And uh, I'll never ask you to do anything. But I will ask you to do one thing for me. Go forth and may you drink the blood of your enemies from the skulls of their children. Oh! <laughs> <laughs>